My name is Lisa Stoner, and I am the coordinator for the Colorado Plateau Dark Sky Cooperative. For this meeting today, we're going to be discussing economic development opportunities around astrotourism. I'm so glad you could join us. First, I'd like to thank my colleagues from the Colorado Plateau Dark Sky Cooperative who helped with the planning of these sessions. You can see the bios for each of our planning team members at the bottom of the Quarterly Connections website. Within our group, we have a wide variety of experience and expertise, but share a common interest in the importance of raising awareness and the need to protect and restore naturally dark skies. So today, I know we have a few participants who attended our first quarterly connections meeting in April. We're glad to see you again. And welcome to those who are joining for the first time. Also, we are pleased to have anyone calling in from the Lake City Colorado Dark Sky Summit, which is a separate event that is going on simultaneously for which this meeting has been included as an alternate event in their agenda. This is exactly what we had hoped. It is our intention to bring people together in a forum like this to support the Dark Sky Network and for all of your efforts. I'm hopeful we can learn from each other today and find ways we can work together in the future. As a quick overview of the Quarterly Connections meeting, we welcome you to follow the Quarterly Connections website. I will paste that into the chat now. If you can click on that link, you'll, quick, you'll see that we have four meetings planned for the year 2023. Each meeting will be recorded and posted to this website. If you didn't have a chance to hear Rustin Hartley's presentation from our first meeting, I encourage you to check out our website and, and watch that video when you have a chance. One goal we have with these meetings is to create an atmosphere where we can connect and engage. In our last meeting, we dropped a link in the chat for everyone to introduce themselves. And I'm going to do that again. What we hope you can do is quickly pick a line and type in your name and introduce yourself. Where are you from? What are your organizational affiliations? Um, perhaps some dark sky work you are involved with. And even if you'd like to discuss what motivates you to do this work around dark skies. I'm going to share my screen now. And by sharing, you can see everybody typing in their names. Wonderful. But if you have done this in the past, you're welcome to just put your name just so we know who you are, who's with us. I think this is a wonderful way to um, save time and um, get to know who's here. Just be a few more moments. Thank you for participating in this effort. With your permission, I'll share this with you individually and you can um, provide any edits later, but I'd like to share this on our website as we did with our last meeting. And we'll get into our presentation for today. Super, okay, well, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. This is a, an editable document, it's shareable um, when I turn off my screen here. So you can continue your comments as you wish. Moving forward, we are so pleased today to have you join us um, on the subject of economic development opportunities around astrotourism. So for today's presentation, we did have some last minute changes for our presenter. I did indicate in a message earlier that Dr. Jordan Smith had an unfortunate last minute conflict that presents him from presenting today, but in his place, I'm very pleased to invite Dr. Emily Wilkins. Emily, you are welcome to join us and by turning on your screen. Welcome, Emily. Um, Thanks, Lisa. Emily has worked extensively with Jordan Smith on this research um, that he was intending to present. She's going to pick up that and discuss it with us. She is Dr. Emily Wilkins is a research social scientist in the social and economic analysis branch at USGS Fort Collins Science Center. And broadly, she conducts research to help inform public land and outdoor recreation management. 
She started working in this research related to dark skies visitors as a postdoctoral researcher while she was in the Institute of Outdoor Recreation and Tourism at Utah State University. Thank you, Emily. I'd love to have you join us and share with us your wisdom on this subject. Thanks, Lisa, for the introduction. I just shared my screen. Can you see it? I sure can. All right, great. So I'm very excited to be sharing some results of this research with you all today. Thanks for joining us. This is a large effort that involves many different team members who are all listed here on the first slide. Um, so like Lisa said, Jordan Smith is the lead author. Um, he is the director of the Institute of Outdoor Recreation and Tourism at Utah State University. Um, couldn't make it today, so I'll be presenting in his place. I'm with the US Geological Survey Fort Collins Science Center out here in Colorado. And we have a bunch of other team members on this project from Utah State University, as well as the Na National Park Service. I'm sure this is not news to anyone here, but parks and protected areas provide opportunities to view dark night skies. Many of us have probably had the experience at some point of being out in a park or protected area, looking up at the night sky and getting to see way more stars, constellations, or even planets than we might be able to see at our home locations. This is an incredible resource that the parks and protected areas often have of having these dark sky resources that are usually much darker and more pristine than we might see at our homes or in urban locations. However, a recent study used citizen science observations of stars and found that the average night sky in Europe and North America specifically became almost 10% brighter each year between 2011 and 2022. Um, so this was using observations from you know, the average person who was going out and looking up at the night sky and seeing how many stars they could see. And so obviously this is gonna be impacting views of the night skies, how many stars people can see and what they can actually see when they look up at the night skies, considering that the skies have been getting so much brighter in the last decade or so. Unfortunately, despite, you know, maybe more this research on more the, the sky glow part of it, we still don't really have a good understanding of who night sky recreationists are um, really anywhere across the US. And so this research sought to answer these first three questions, starting with who are night sky recreationists, um, specifically asking like, how many nighttime visitors are actually participating in night sky recreation and what types of activities are they participating in? Our second question was, do these types of visitors have unique travel and spending patterns? So there's a little bit of a perception or maybe stereotype that dark sky visitors might be a little bit older, a little bit wealthier, spending more money in the local economies. And we wanted to see if there was any truth to this stereotype. And then the last question we ask is more of an applied question. And we were looking at how do these night sky dependent recreationists want night skies managed? Um, so very practical question for managers, if there are any manage management actions that visitors would support them taking to protect night skies. And the specific location of this research is in some of the darkest areas in the country. Um, I'm sure this map is probably not new for most of you on this call today, but this map shows light pollution across the US. So you can see the dark red areas and yellow areas show the most light pollution where the, the darker black and dark blue areas show the least light pollution. So the areas highlighted, the Basin and Range and Colorado Plateau, dark sky cooperatives represent some of the darkest areas in the country. And this study and this research is specifically gonna be focused on Utah since it's one of the darkest places and it's probably likely that people are traveling to Utah from other regions of the US that might experience more light pollution if they want to see dark skies specifically. And then within Utah, we have one of the highest concentrations of dark sky places. So this map shows all the places that are designated by the International Dark Sky Association, um, or referred to as IDA, as IDA designated parks. So Utah has 10 state parks that are designated as IDA certified. Those are the parks that you can see in this map in orange. 
All five of Utah's national parks are IDA designated. They are the ones in red on the map. I think five out of six of the national monuments are IDA designated and those are indicated in the green. And then there's some community and local parks as well that are IDA designated. So our effort in this study was really trying to contact people participating in dark sky related activities at a select set of these IDA designated parks across the state of Utah. So we ended up choosing nine different parks to do this visitor survey at that were somewhat representative of all these different IDA parks across Utah. And so we had one national monument, which was Natural Bridges National Monument. I think the first dark sky certified park in Utah. And then we had four of Utah's national parks uh, were part of the study and that includes Bryce Canyon National Park, Arches, Canyonlands, and Capitol Reef National Park. And then we had four state parks as well that included three state parks in southern central Utah and one state park in northern Utah. And across the study, we had 82 days of sampling nights. And I know that sounds a little bit funny the way it's phrased there, um, but I say it that way because we were really trying to target nighttime visitors. And so a traditional visitor survey usually takes place during the day for like a six hour time block where people might be out surveying in the morning or in the afternoon. But this study was a little bit different in that we were only really surveying visitors around sunset time. So we were aiming to be out surveying roughly one and a half hours before sunset and then one and a half hours after sunset. So it's a smaller sampling window of only like three hours and really focused on the nighttime visitors. Across those 82 days, we had 634 complete survey responses and that was a total response rate of 81.7%, which is on par with other similar visitor surveys and actually a pretty good response rate when you're considering that we're often asking these people to fill out a survey maybe right before they're about to go to bed. So this sampling effort started in April 2021 and went for a little longer than a year. And the reason it was so long is essentially we didn't want to do surveys in the summer when the sunset was so late that to talk to visitors, it would have to be past 10 p.m. Um, so we didn't want our survey techs and people collecting the data to be out there really past 10 p.m. So when the, the sunset's really late in the summer, it made sampling and talking to visitors more challenging. So most of these sampling nights happened in either the fall or spring seasons when the sunset was a little bit earlier. And we were contacting visitors at campgrounds, popular overlooks, um, popular parking lots where people might be at night. It's a little harder to find visitors in the nighttime hours. Um, so the sampling locations were a little different, but mostly at campgrounds and overlooks. And then getting into our first question of really, well, who are these night sky recreationists? So in this research, we are taking a behavioral approach where we say, if an individual participates in one of three different activities that depends on the quality of the night sky, then they are considered to be a night sky dependent recreationist. So those three activities we are considering as night sky related activities are listed here on this slide. And that includes viewing wildlife at night, night sky photography, and night sky viewing and astronomy. So the first one of those, viewing wildlife at night, um, it can involve taking pictures of mammals at night, such as this photo of the fox, or it could also involve visitors going out and looking for insects at night too. Night sky photography really involves anyone who's going out with a camera with the intent to take pictures of the night sky. So this could be professional photographers or just amateur photographers trying to capture any photos related to the night sky. And then a little different than photography is night sky viewing or astronomy where people are out to view the night sky but not necessarily to take photos of it. So some of these people might, you know, be more professional astronomers or have like these fancy telescopes like this picture shows. Um, they might be really out there with equipment to do astronomy, but this also includes people who are just night sky viewing, maybe 
going out with their naked eye to look at the stars uh, without any telescopes or specific equipment. Uh, certainly I have fallen into that category a lot where I don't know, own a telescope, but I've gone to parks for night sky viewing. So again, this is a behavioral approach to defining night sky recreationists, where if someone is participating in one of these, these three activities, we are considering them a dark sky dependent recreationist. This is somewhat similar to like how we consider other activities like hunting. So if someone participates in hunting, we often call them a hunter, whether or not they would necessarily identify as a hunter. Um, usually it's like if they participate in the activity, we would call them a hunter. And so this is a similar approach where if they're participating in one of these activities for this research, we're gonna call them a night sky dependent recreationist. Importantly, this categorization does not include other activities that just happen to be in parks at night, but aren't necessarily night sky dependent. So you can think of this as like camping where people are outside at night uh, if they're camping, but they're not necessarily dependent on the night sky like people would be if they're doing astronomy or viewing wildlife at night or night sky photography. All right, so getting into some of the data and results here. Um, so this first slide shows the activities visitors are participating in across these nine different parks and protected areas in Utah. And the main takeaway here is that many nighttime park visitors are dependent on dark night skies. So in total, we saw that 62% of these nighttime park visitors were participating in one of the three activities that was defined as dark sky dependent. And notably, I think the 62% was not significantly different between state park visitors and national park visitors. So overall, across these results, we did not really see many big differences between visitors who we surveyed in state parks versus national parks. Um, so for all the rest of the results, they're gonna be combined. And that overall percentage of 62 was very similar between national and state parks. But going through the results here and looking at the activities visitors are participating in, we first see a lot of the same activities come up as we would see maybe in a daytime sample of visitors. So we see hiking, scenic driving. Um, a lot of people were camping, again, because we surveyed them at night, that kind of makes sense. But we saw that 56% of these nighttime visitors said that they were participating in night sky viewing and astronomy. We saw 15% were participating in night sky photography and 14% participating in wildlife observation at night. And when I go through the rest of these results, um, sometimes I'll just say park visitors, but throughout all of this, we're always referring to the sample of nighttime park visitors. That's really um, the hours right around sunset. So it's not necessarily the, a sample of all park visitors and not representative of visitors during the day, which really makes this data a little bit unique. So the second thing I wanted to show is breaking out activity participation between visitors who are night sky dependent and other visitors. And the main takeaway here is that night sky dependent recreationists participate in a more diverse set of activities relative to other nighttime park visitors. So if we look at the figure here, um, it's broken down by the two groups. And so the blue bar on the left represents night sky dependent visitors and the green bars on the right represent other visitors. The ones with the asterisks above them mean that the differences between the groups are statistically significant, significantly different. Um, so the first five activities, there's statistically significant differences between these two groups. Um, in all cases, we see the blue bar is higher. So there's higher participation from night sky dependent visitors for hiking, scenic driving, developed camping, wildlife observation during the day and visiting historic or cultural sites. There are not significant differences in some of the activities that have a little bit lower participation like mountain biking, road cycling, uh, rafting or canoeing or horseback riding. So overall, this is showing us that night sky dependent recreationists are tending to participate in more activities than those who don't participate in night sky dependent recreation. Our second question was looking at, do these dark sky dependent recreationists have unique travel and spending patterns? And the first thing we wanted to highlight here is that night skies visitors are staying longer than other visitors. 
So 95% of total visitors, both at state parks as well as national parks, said that they were staying overnight on their trip to the park. So only 5% of visitors were day visitors. And again, this probably makes sense considering we were talking to visitors somewhat late at night. Um, you know, if someone's out in a park at 9 p.m., for, for the most part, the odds are probably high that they're not going all the way back to their home location. So 95% of visitors were overnight visitors. And of those, we asked them how many days they were staying in the local area. And night sky dependent visitors were staying on average a little longer than four days, whereas other visitors were staying closer to three days on their trip. So we do see, and these differences are significant. So we do see here that night sky visitors are staying on average one extra day compared to other visitors. However, and this is really interesting, um, even though these dark skies dependent visitors are staying longer, they are not spending significantly more money in the local area. So this figure shows the mean trip costs for, I think it's 10 or 11 different categories we asked about on the survey um, during their trip. And so again, this is broken down by the night sky dependent visitors and other visitors with the night sky visitors in blue and the other visitors in green. So looking across all these different categories of spending during their trip, there are no statistically significant differences in any of these categories between the two groups. However, we can still see there's some little differences, even if they're not statistically significant. Um, such as for rental cars, we can see that other visitors are spending a little bit more on rental cars on average. Um, but for most of the other categories, there's really not any big differences in the mean trip costs that visitors are spending. And I think this is really interesting because this is kind of contrary to the point that dark skies visitors might be wealthier and spending more money in the local economies. And so even though these visitors are having longer trips and staying an extra day, they're still spending roughly the same amount of money or they would be spending a little bit less on a per day basis. And we did also ask visitors about socio-demographic characteristics, including income. And there was no significant differences in annual household income between night sky dependent visitors and other visitors. So that probably explains this as well, since there's no real differences in income level. There's not really any significant differences here in levels of spending. We did, however, find that dark sky dependent visitors were on average a little bit older than um, the non dark sky dependent visitors. So the mean difference in age was about three years older for night sky dependent visitors. Uh, but there's not any differences in terms of like gender or race of who those night sky visitors were and who other visitors were. So our third question I wanted to touch on today was how do these visitors want night skies managed? And so again, this is a really more applied question about if managers can take actions to support night sky quality and if and how visitors may or may not support different actions. So this, I think, is the most important or interesting piece of data that we collected that was a little bit surprising in how stark it was. And so the main takeaway here is that the vast majority of park visitors support management actions to make parks darker. So on the survey, we gave visitors a list of seven different possible management actions to help protect night sky quality. And these seven actions were taken from the principles of responsible and sustainable lighting um, from a few different organizations, including the Park Service. But these are all feasible actions that could be taken. And we asked them if they supported it, if they were neutral, really didn't care one way or the other, or they opposed each management, app, uh, each management action, sorry. And so the seven different actions we asked them about were adjusting hues of lights to be wildlife friendly, adjusting hues of lights to preserve humans' night vision, creating shields on lights that direct light only to intended areas, installing sensors or timers that turn lights only on when needed, reducing the number of outdoor lights in the park, restricting the number of lights visitors can use at night, 
and setting lights to the minimum necessary brightness. But what is interesting here, if you look at the results, um, so the big green bars all indicate support for these individual management actions where the gray bars represent neutral and the red bars represent opposition. So we can see all of these actions are very supported. Um, six out of the seven have support over 80%, which you know, for any kind of park management action is actually pretty impressive to have so much support. So overall, these are very supported. Um, the opposition is pretty small, I think less than 5% for most of them. Um, one thing that I think is interesting to point out is the management action that says restricting the number of lights visitors can use at night has a little bit less support than all the others. Um, you can see that's the only one where the green bar is under 80%. So restricting the number of lights visitors can use at night is a little bit less supported than the other than the six other actions, um, but overall still the majority of visitors would support that. And this figure represents all nighttime visitors that we surveyed, not just those who were dark sky dependent. So if we look at visitors who are only dark sky dependent, for most of these management actions, there's even more support when you only are talking to visitors who are doing dark skies related activities. But overall, the findings here are pretty clear that nighttime visitors are overwhelmingly supporting these actions to protect night sky quality. And then we also asked if and how visitors would like to receive more information on night skies viewing or astronomy, ways to improve night sky viewing, native connections to the night skies, and or viewing wildlife at night. And overwhelmingly, many, many visitors did say that they wanted to receive more information on these topics with um, night sky viewing and astronomy being the most popular topic and viewing wildlife at night being the least popular topic people wanted more information about. And so if people said that they did want more information on any of these four topics, we asked them how they would like to receive more information on these topics. And uh, the visitors doing the surveys, they could choose more than one. Um, so some of these might add up to more than 100% because they could choose two different categories if they would like to receive information two different ways. Um, but looking at the results, we can see that ranger-led programs are the most preferred source of information about night sky viewing. Um, this is the case for the top three different information types where ranger-led programs were really the favored source. And this probably isn't a big surprise because I think in other surveys across other parks in the US, it's pretty common that ranger-led programs are usually the preferred source of information. But I think one thing that's interesting to note here is that smartphone applications were usually number two, pretty close behind ranger-led programs. And then for viewing wildlife at night, we actually saw the interpretive displays as the number one most preferred source of information. And this might be telling us that for nighttime related topics, visitors might want to do some of the, the learning opportunities on their own time. And essentially like maybe not always go to a ranger led program at, at nine or 10 PM. And they might want to have alternatives like smartphone applications or uh, interpretive displays so that they could go through some of this information uh, at their own pace at their own time, which might be a little different for all of these activities that take place at night. And then the last piece of results I wanted to show are also, I think, really interesting. This is about visitors' awareness of IDA designation and its importance in their decision to visit their park. So in the total sample across all visitors at night, 42% of visitors we contacted at night were aware of the IDA designation of the park. So that means over half, 58% uh, of nighttime visitors were not aware of the IDA designation. And if we break this down into dark sky dependent recreationists and those that aren't dark sky dependent, we saw that about 47% of dark sky dependent recreationists knew about the IDA designation compared to 34% of visitors not part participating in dark sky dependent recreation. So even among dark sky recreationists over half did not know about the IDA designation. 
But what's really interesting, I think, is for those visitors who did know about the IDA designation, we asked them how important that status was in their decision to visit the park. And so if we look at this uh, bar chart here on the left, we can see the responses for all visitors put together. And then it's broken down into night sky dependent visitors in the blue in the middle and other visitors in the green on the right. And this was a five point Likert scale question ranging from not important at all for their decision to visit and then somewhat important is in the middle and extremely important is on, on the right hand side. And so we can see if we compare the kind of the distributions of the blue bar charts in the middle to the green one, we can see that for night sky dependent visitors, the IDA designation was overall, I would say probably much more important than for other visitors. And for these Night sky dependent visitors, we can see a lot of people were in the extremely important, very important, or somewhat important categories, with only, I think, a little bit over 10% saying it was not at all important. For the other visitors, it's a little different, um, where there's very few visitors who said it was extremely important, um, but it was a little bit over 30% said it was not at all important. Although I did think it was interesting that even visitors who were not participating in dark sky dependent recreation um, you know, a, a, good, a good percentage of them still said it was somewhat important or very important, um, even if they maybe weren't participating in these activities. So I know that was a lot of bar charts um, and graphs to throw at you and maybe a, a 20 or 30 minutes here. So I wanted to go over some of the main takeaways from this. So the first is that many park visitors in Utah State National Parks are dependent on dark night skies. So we saw about 62% of visitors out at night were participating in dark sky dependent recreational opportunities. Second, night sky dependent recreationists participate in a more diverse set of activities relative to other nighttime park visitors. We don't necessarily know why this is, um, but one reason could be that night sky dependent recreationists tend to have trips that are a day longer on average. Um, so they just might have longer trips and more time to participate in more activities compared to visitors who are not participating in dark skies activities. The third point is that night sky dependent recreationists have similar spending patterns relative to other nighttime park visitors. And I think this was interesting and somewhat surprising um, since you know, the kind of perception and narrative has been that night sky dependent recreationists are spending more money, you know, maybe they're a little bit wealthier, maybe they have telescopes or fancy cameras to take pictures of the night sky. And that's really not what we're seeing in the data that these people are more wealthy or spending more money. Um, so of course, there's probably a lot of people out participating in night sky related activities that don't have any kind of fancy equipment and are just going out to look at the stars and appreciate the night sky um, with their eyes without needing a telescope. The fourth point is that most park visitors support management actions to make parks darker. And this was also really interesting, maybe somewhat expected, but I think we weren't expecting how overwhelming the support would be. So, you know, over 80% of visitors supporting six out of seven different management actions and less than 5% opposing them. And I guess I should have mentioned earlier, maybe a reason that some visitors would oppose any of these actions would usually be for safety concerns. So um, when you're taking these various management actions to make parks darker and protect night skies, sometimes there's safety concerns with visitors not being able to find the trail or not being able to see well to go to the bathroom, maybe tripping on something or just the perception of maybe if you're there alone, it might seem not as safe if areas aren't well lit. So in other studies, the number one reason people tend to give for maybe wanting light at night is for safety concerns. But for our sample of visitors, um, you know, still the vast majority of visitors we're supporting these different management actions and that didn't seem to be a top concern for a lot of the visitors we surveyed. The fifth bullet point is that ranger led programs are still the most preferred source of information about night sky viewing. Although in a lot of cases, uh, smartphone applications were 
not quite as popular as major led programs, but not too far behind. So there may be some visitors who want to get information about dark skies um, more at their own time or at their own pace. And then finally, most nighttime visitors don't know about IDA designations. So over half of nighttime visitors didn't know about IDA designations, including over half of visitors who were there specifically for dark skies activities. But the majority of visitors who did know about the IDA designation said it was an important factor in their decision to visit the park. And with that, I will leave you with this. Um, all these results are already published in a full report that the Park Service hosts on their website. Um, I think I can drop the link in the chat or Lisa can put it in the chat. Um, you can go there to find all this information and more from the survey. And if you have any questions, you are free to contact me or I'll take questions now. Or you can always email the lead author, uh, Dr. Jordan Smith at Utah State University. Emily, thank you. That was excellent. I have not put the link in there yet, um, but we will try to get that to you. Great presentation on very exciting research. You point out a lot of really important, interesting information. And if I were to say anything right off the top, I was particularly pleased Pleased to hear that the different types of dark sky dependent recreationists are really quite broad. You mentioned, um, for example, the average income was um, not significantly different for those who are night sky dependent to other visitors at the park. So perhaps a little older in some cases, but it points to how we have a wide range of people we can really connect with when promoting the importance of dark skies and planning dark sky activities. So um, I was really excited about that. I'd love anyone who'd like to jump in with more questions directed towards Emily. Um, we have a Q&A. We have 15 minutes or so, 10 minutes to talk about what questions you might have. John, John, do you have a question? Yeah, I do. Thank you, Lisa. And um, thank you, Emily. That was really great. This is helpful to have this data out there as we're often asked questions along these lines and so far we haven't had a lot to point to in this regard when people are thinking about developing places for dark sky protections and they have a, a an eye towards drawing tourists. Um, my question is for you. I thank you for the link there to the report. Um, do you plan to submit this to peer review publication anywhere? Yes, so we have one publication in review already at the Journal of Environmental Management um, that has some of these results and maybe a little bit more um, with a focus really on the management actions and support for management actions. And I think we might have one more peer reviewed publication in the works that's not submitted yet to any journal. Okay, great. Uh, and my other question is, I, I understand that this is a, it's a limited scope, you know, there were you got a really good response rate. So that's that's helpful, but it's a limited number of parks. It's a limited geography. And this is always a $64,000 question, which is how more broadly applicable do you think these results are? And kind of the second part of that is, is there a selection effect because it's the plateau and it's you know an area that's well known for outdoor recreation. It has kind of a reputation already for dark skies. Is that something that influences the results in a way that we couldn't say, well, you know, dark sky tourists everywhere kind of have these same sort of characteristics. Yeah, those are great questions. Um, and that's always the million dollar question of how and where can you extrapolate the results to? Um, so I'll try my best to answer both of those. And I think the first point that to me is interesting is that there were not really any differences between the state park visitors and the national park visitors. Um, for a number of different questions, like we didn't really see any big differences. And to me, that was surprising. Um, we had a few more, like the sample size for the national park visitors is a little higher than the state parks, but overall it was still big enough to compare them. Um, and there weren't really differences between those groups. And so in that way, I would say it's maybe a little bit more applicable to other locations than we would expect, um, you know, if we're seeing roughly the same things at state and national parks. And for your second point on if it's biased at all because people are coming to Utah because they know it's a great place for dark skies viewing. I don't know, I think that's really hard to answer, but I think the fact that over 50% of visitors didn't know it was an IDA park 
might at least indicate that in that way, there's not that much bias in the data because those people probably weren't coming to Utah specifically for the night skies. They didn't know it was IDA certified. Um, and so, yes, there might be some bias in the 42% of people who did know that it was IDA certified, but it's hard to quantify exactly how much bias there would be and if it would be different in other places. Um, I suspect if you did a similar survey in other Western locations, you might get somewhat similar results, but you know, if you did a similar survey on the East Coast, it might be completely different. Great, thank you. Thanks, John. Do I have any other questions coming through? I Feel free to post a question by raising your virtual hand. I do have a couple of things in the chat that I thought were important to be meant to mention here. Thanks, Don Nilsen from Oregon, who mentioned during your talk, Emily, as a longtime amateur astronomer, she says, I can tell you that a large number of our members come to club star parties throughout the region in their own RVs and thus stay on site and cook meals in their RV. That's probably you aren't seeing significant differences in community spending. I thought that was an important point. Thank you, Don, for mentioning that. And for anyone who works at the parks themselves, Don mentioned, what about life curfews at campsites? Is there any discussion around that question? Anyone would like to jump in on that? Okay. I don't think I've heard anything specifically about light curfews at campsites, but that would definitely be interesting to look into. Yeah, and how those are perceived across the nature of your dark sky dependent recreationists and, and otherwise. I was going to drop it in the chat, but I'm going to say it really quickly. With your comments about night sky recreation is um, wanting their information mostly through ranger-led programs. I wanted to introduce the idea of a, a new project that at the National and State Parks in Utah, we will be distributing a dark sky passport. It is a program that we were funded to get to build these little passports for families and youth to utilize in conjunction with existing educational programs, night sky pr programs. So pretty excited um, to share that with you. I'll drop that in the link here in the chat in just a second. There's a couple other questions that I'd like to just share. Are, are night sky tourists more stewardship focused? Emily, is that something you could address? I don't know the answer to that. That would be really interesting. We didn't ask any questions related to stewardship um, or environmental behaviors and things like that. So I don't know, but that would be a great topic for a future study. Yes, yeah, it would be. Don also mentioned it would be great to see similar, similar studies in Eastern places like Cherry Springs State Park in Pennsylvania. Um, so are you aware of any of the research similar to what you've done here in the West um, in other parts of the United States, Emily? I don't think there has been a visitor survey at night. Um, as we learn, there's a lot of challenges with trying to conduct a visitor survey and actually talk to visitors at night. Um, oftentimes there's a lot fewer of them. They're more dispersed. You have to hire someone to go out at 9, 10 p.m. for a shorter window to talk to visitors. So there's a lot of challenges with doing a survey like this. So I don't think someone else has done a visitor survey at night. I know there is a group from Penn State University that has been doing some work, and I think they're maybe starting a study in Acadia soon, that is going to look at like actual light levels and have, have visitors go out and actually look at various light levels and get visitor preferences for that. Um, but so far, I think this is the only similar visitor stu study that's taken place at night, specifically to look at dark skies related visitors. Okay, that's great. There is also a little discussion um, that Gina Pearson brought up about the language regarding certification instead of designation. Gina states, I would suggest using the term certification instead of designation because only Congress can make special designations for yeah, national parks. Yeah, I completely parts. agree. Yeah, so just kind of catching some of the comments here. Anil. Yeah, I just um, wanted to follow up on the, the question about the stewardship. I was just wondering about whether, you know, for those questions where you were asking 
about the, you know, 80% of people wanted action on, uh, you know, or supported having some actions towards night sky visiting was that was, I think what, from all the visitors, if I understood right, was there a difference between the night sky visitors and the non night sky visitors there? Sorry. There was a statistically significant difference for four out of the seven different management actions. And so for those four, dark sky dependent visitors had higher support um, as we'd probably expect than other recreationists. And then for three out of the seven management actions, there was no difference between the two groups of visitors. Thank you. Looks like we have another question from Dawn. Would you like to present your question? Yeah, following up on you know what John said, I, I do think it would be fairly different in places out east where there's not such an abundance of dark skies. Um, and so, I, I mean, I know folks from the East uh, Coast who drive five hours plus to go to Cherry Springs to do observing. And so I suspect that there's a lot of money being spent in places because of their rarity back East. Um, and, and in, you know, we, we're just sitting in such a sweet spot out West. <laughs> um, and, I, and I just wanna point out, cause it's a pet peeve and I bring this up in just about every tourism meeting I'm, I'm at, I'm heavily engaged in astrotourism as I'm heavily engaged in anything that's going to move the needle to protect our dark skies. And it's a pet peeve when we use imagery like that's shown here because it's mixed message uh, messaging for the people we want to attract. If we have people who want to light up geological places with really super bright LED lights to get a picture, that's not really kind of the messaging. And the Ben Canales lit up tent that's on practically every cover of everybody trying to do astrotourism is a tent that's not occupied. So it's like, it's light where you don't need it. <laughs> so it's just a pet peeve, but pictures really matter. They, they, they impart a story. And if we want to protect the night, we just have to kind of have maybe not such a dynamic picture of that's a lit by other, anything other than just the stars. Yeah, that's a good comment. Definitely great to consider. I'd like to uh, look at the time just real quick that we have about four minutes left in the interest of time. I'd like to first thank you, Emily, for sharing your wisdom with us today and your expertise joining us with this forum. Um, you've shared some really important topics for us all to consider around developing economic opportunities with astrotourism, no matter wherever you are. As I mentioned earlier in this meeting, um, one of our main hopes is to um, really bring people together across the Colorado Plateau and beyond. I thank everybody for joining us from every corner where you are from and for filling out our um, introductions um, document. I will share that online as well as the recording here. There are so many of you working in your diverse ways in your communities and finding ways to educate and raise awareness and protecting and storing the light night sky. We really commend you for that work. So I hope today's session was as informative to you as it was for me. And uh, to end, um, I'd like to, we encourage you to join us next time in September, on September 6th at one o'clock Mountain Daylight Time, when we will focus on education and outreach advocacy so finally, I'm going to paste in our chat here, the feedback survey. Please help us by completing the survey to let us know what you would like to hear about so we can provide the most informative and substantial quarterly connections that meet your needs. So with that, I thank you for your time. If you take a look at that survey, I really appreciate your help by filling that out. Thank you, Emily, and best wishes to you all. Have a great day.